This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hi, he is a 75-year-old gentleman who has this mature white cataract. Along with that, he has got pseudo exfoliation and a moderately dilating pupil. The nucleus appears to be slightly denser and these are the challenges which I am anticipating. We have got a smaller pupil to deal with. We have an intumescent lens, so rexus could be challenging. And underneath this, I expect a dense nucleus looking at the color of the cataract. And lastly, I am also expecting loose zonules in these patients. So I am aware of all these complexities and let's see how things turn out. The surgery is being done under topical anesthesia. Patient has extremely deep set eyes. So I would be using my assistant's help to keep on actively suck off all the fluid which is being accumulated. I have used intracameral lignocaine with tropicamide and phenylephrine combination which would help me to get a better intraoperative midriasis and also maintain it well. Using dispersive ovary to coat the endothelium, the main incision is created. I'm using OVD to just remove the air and also lift up the iris a little bit. I plan to use uh, two Y hooks to stretch the pupil a little bit so that the pupillary midriasis is maintained towards the surgery. One of the common questions I encounter is that can we do stretch pupilloplasty in using just the intracameral anesthetic? Yes, you can. In this clip, we can demonstrate the fact that the, using just intracameral lignocaine, the iris can be manipulated and a stretch pupilloplasty can be performed without causing any discomfort to the patient. We have a challenge here that the lens is very swollen and there's always a risk of the Y hook rupturing the anticapsule. So extreme care has to be taken not to touch the anticapsule by performing the stretch pupilloplasty in this situation. To prevent the globe from turning away the patient just moving it, I would prefer to stabilize the eye using a second instrument. In this case, I'm using the instrument which is called as the Banaji's Eye Lock, which is designed by Dr. Banaji. Just helps me to stabilize the globe better when I'm trying to perform the rexis. The anticapsule is very tense because the lens is very swollen and there is every risk of the rexis running away to the periphery. So I'm aiming to make a very small rexis. I can feel that the capsule is very tense and I'm going to use only the tearing technique to perform the initial small rexus. So I'm not folding the capsule here, I'm just keeping it flat and pulling it centripetally so that the rexus is always in control and is not running away. I have a rexus which is very small, it's about 2.5 to 3 millimeter and before enlarging the rexus I need to decompress the bag. In this case, I'm going to use a bimanual irrigation aspiration cannula. One can clearly see that uh, the bag also has a tendency to move along with the nucleus. This is a clear evidence that there is generalized zonular weakness. I'm not going to use my FACO tip, which is my preferred method in this situation, simply because the opening of the capsule is very small and I don't want to damage the margins inadvertently with the FACO tip. I am very careful not to tug at these anticapsular edges because these capsules are very thin, flimsy and vulnerable for tearing. The hand is fished and the remaining quadrant, the overlying cortex which is swollen is aspirated out. Although some of the posteriorly placed cortex, it cannot be manipulated out because the nucleus itself is bulky and I have a smaller rexus. So even though the decompression is not full, I am forced to enlarge the rexus now itself. I want to ensure that the cut is tangential, not radial. That's the reason the angle of attack is from the side port. This ensures that the flap which is there is not going to run away. Again, the globe is stabilized with the second instrument. Now this flap is held with the forceps and I am now performing the secondary bigger rexus. I am using a micro forceps to the side port itself. Hence I am avoiding going from the main incision that which can compromise the depth of the chamber. As the rexus is being enlarged, I reach this point just anterior to the side port and this becomes a little bit cumbersome for me to maneuver the flap. So I stop here 
and inject a little bit over your deep in the chamber and then switch hands and change the angle of attack. I'm using uh, the same forceps, the opposite side port so that I can see well and control the tear much better. So I do have a Rexus but it's not the most ideal size, it's still on the smaller side but this should be sufficient to manage the nucleus. So moving on to the next challenge is to deal with this hard nucleus and along with that I'm expecting the zonules to be slightly compromised in this eye because of pseudo exfoliation. Hydrodissection is avoided in such cases with intermittent cataract. The phaco emulsification probe is introduced and uh, after aspirating the superficial nucleus, I am trying to rotate the nucleus and in this case, I am very conscious of rotating the nucleus by using both the instruments. So this is going to put in less stress in the bag when the nucleus rotation is being happening. I am using this technique of a bimanual rotation of the nucleus uh, simply because this puts in less stress on the zonules and uh, this is a case wherein I am suspecting the zonules not to be in great health. The superficial epinucleus and cortex is aspirated and as is my strategy in denser nucleus, I begin by making a small central trench. Once I've reached 50% depth, I change the settings to the chop mode. The phaco tip is buried and a vertical chop maneuver is done which splits the nucleus in the distal half. The posterior plate is quite thick and is still holding on. The process of vertical chop is being performed. I am finding it difficult to break the posterior plate. The peripheral fragment is being aspirated inside but the central posterior plate is refusing to break at this stage. As the nucleus is being rotated, one can clearly see that uh, the bag also has a tendency to move along with the nucleus. This is a clear evidence that there is generalized zonular weakness. I need to be conscious about being very gentle when I'm trying to maneuver these nuclear fragments or trying to divide them. The nucleus is quite dense and breaking the posterior plate is going to be a challenge but usually these cases can be dealt with easily enough. Only thing which is required is patience. Keep chopping the peripheral nucleus and consuming the peripheral nucleus, the central plate eventually gives up. Ovid is replenished and time to divide the remaining M nucleus. Uh, the second heminucleus is divided into three smaller fragments and each of them is then consumed quite easily. I am careful to ensure that the plane of emulsification is at the level of the rexus margin. Eventually all the nuclear fragments are emulsified safely. Time to aspirate the cortex. During cortex aspiration, there is a hint of localized zonular dehiscence at this place. It doesn't look to be a very large, thankfully. Not much of a cortex is remaining, so time to implant the CTR. The bag is inflated with cohesive OVD and the CTR is threaded into the bag. I always prefer to use a Sinsky hook to push the CTR inside as it is being threaded to minimize any stress on the zonular apparatus as it is being threaded in. A multi-piece hydrophobic lens is being implanted into the bag. With the lens inside the bag, time to enlarge the rexus. Using a micro scissors and a forceps, the rexus is enlarged. OVD both in front and behind the lens is aspirated out. 
time to close. The wounds are hydro stitched. That's it, the case is done. Thank you for watching and hope you found this helpful.